Yeah, I mean, I think of all of the teams, uh, you can see that Mercedes have made some progress with the car. Uh, they've been very open about the problems that they've had. So um, they, it looks as though now back under James Allison's full control, they, they seem to be making the right sort of noises and the right steps. So fingers crossed for them uh, that we get a more competitive year. Yeah, the problems with the car last year were the, you know, it had a you know, very weak rear axle, you know, very hard to control car. The suspension wasn't very well matched to the underfloor and Hamilton didn't like the seating position. So the kind of the big thing that I notice about the car or I know about the car from what they've been saying is they've changed the layout of the car. And this includes the zero pods, which we'll, come, we'll talk about the side pods a bit later, but they've changed the layout. So they've moved the cockpit further backwards along the wheelbase. They've changed the, uh, the rear suspension setup, and no doubt they've done a huge amount of work on the springs and the dampers and getting the suspension to match the performance of the floor, which has kind of been their biggest floor completely overall of the past two years, you know, ignoring every other little design detail. Fundamentally, that's what they've struggled with. And James Allison said, we, you know, we've addressed those areas. We put a big amount of development, a lot of our you know, money and aero resources into those areas. And that's the kind of the initial thing. When I first looked at the car, and I think the first post I put on social media is, you know, Mercedes have gone conventional. The car looks, you know, from a top-down view, very conventional in its layout. You know, the, there's no weird side pods. There's no other sort of weird, unique sort of elements to it. So at first, my, maybe my heart sank a bit that we've seen, you know, McLaren and Ferrari, but both with very generative cars rather than something that's a lot more radical but actually when you start to look at some of the detail on the w15 it does start to get quite interesting and shows that they're not just kind of copying you know what red bull and alpine and Aston martin and everyone else has kind of done over the past couple of years they've really got some unique ideas probably the first one is yeah we'll talk about the side pods because everybody you know looks at that straight away again as i say the floor is more important but we <laughs> they're not showing us photos of that so the side pods have now got rid of that very strange detached front section and the zero pod section at the back that's allowed them to kind of repackage the car that's what's allowed the cockpit to move backwards and while it looks like a fairly conventional, you know, undercut side pod, it's quite radical. You've got a kind of a P-shaped inlet, creating a really big undercut, really work in the front edge of the floor. And then you have, you know, the usual sort of downwash and gullies, but a very, very deep undercut under the side pod all the way down the frontal view really shows you the amount of space they've got under the radiators on the side pods. And this is all about floor performance um you know you're kind of giving up volumes and shapes of radiators and things in order to get the floor edge and the you know the diffuser exits working so much better no doubt they're going to add loads of bits lots of bits to the floor and the floor edge as we get through testing but that's what we've seen so far because of the, the zero pod had such an effect on particularly the size and shape of the fuel tank that kind of pushed the fuel up and pushed everything outwards um, I think they're going back to a much less compromised design. So I think they've kind of done the right thing in that respect. Um, they've said that they've, you know, we know from the Aston Martin that they've changed the rear gearbox carrier, both in length and it's gone to a pushrod rear suspension now, which just frees up more space for the tunnels. So that's all kind of quite good and obvious. Big investment in that area. And of course, because we're in a budget cap, um, add an aero resource cap. They've kept the front push rod suspension, so it's push rod front and rear. Now, some people seem to think you've got to have one, a different one at each end, but that's you know that's just rubbish. It, it doesn't matter. But you know they had to make compromises at some point, and I don't think it's particularly big compromise on the front end to go either push rod or pull rod. They've changed the suspension layout slightly in that area as well. So that's all kind of really sort of common sense stuff. Then the other thing that stood out on the, the real car that we saw in the garage is the front wing. So if we think back to the regulation changes back in 2022, the new front wings of these cars had to have four elements and the four elements had to come from the nose out to the end plate. And you couldn't you know, stop one of the elements short. You couldn't have a three element wing in some areas and the four element wings. But when you actually look at it and you see that middle section of front wing that's got a slightly spoon shape, goes back to the sort of 2000s again, little dip to the front. They're actually working that middle section of the, the nose and the front wing quite differently to anybody else. They're actually working it quite hard. But when you count the elements next to the wing, at first you only count three and not four. So it's like, well, what's going on here? 
what they've actually done is they've narrowed that fourth element, that last flap that runs along the trailing edge of the wing. And it's just shrunk down to like, you know, sort of 10 millimeter, 20 millimeters, just to meet the legal requirements of getting the nose working. And this is helping in two areas. First of all, it means that you're getting less losses from that middle section of wing that's so aggressively uh, upwashed. And that's all working to kind of rotate the airflow going into the tunnels. But what it also does is it exposes a real sharp edge to that last element. And this goes back to sort of, you know, the, the pre-2022s when we had the Y250 vortex and they were trying to shape the front wing to create an airflow that went in between the body of the car and the front wheel to push airflow outwards, outwash, which was what the 2022 regulations were all about trying to get rid of. Now Merck seem to have found a way of re-energizing that vortex by having this um, I call it the 3.1 wing because it's not a three element wing and it's not a four element wing. So you've got about 0.1 of a wing there somewhere. And I, as I can read the regulations, it's legal. I'm sure the other teams will have looked at these, pre this, these ideas previously and have discounted them. But I think there will be some discussion about this amongst the FIA, F1 and the team saying, you know, if this is introducing outwash, is this something we want in the sport again? You know, haven't we worked so hard to kind of get rid of the problems of cars following each other? So I think that while it isn't a big performance differentiator for the W15, I think it is something that will just kind of capture people's uh, imagination and start to get talking. I'm sure there'll be some conspiracy theories and bits and pieces of people saying that it's illegal. But as far as I can see, it's, it's a, a cheeky but um, permissible way of playing with front wing. But do the regulations state you must have four elements or does it state you can't have less than four elements? It says that you, well, it says you can have up to four, but what it says is uh, if you have them, they have to span from merge into the nose and go all the way across. So you can't have like one closed section somewhere. You can't have a four element outboard and a three element inboard. So there has to be something to add up that fourth element in the middle. And that's exactly what they've done. And good, good for them for showing it to us so, so clearly um, on the launch pictures, <laughs> uh, which is always good. But uh, yeah, I mean, again, I think it's, it's just something that will maybe get some talk. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, probably isn't as important to all those other big things that they've, they've done to the rest of the car. Well, speaking of the grand scheme of things, if we go back to 2022 and we say it was a zero pod Mercedes, are we now, with the hindsight, are we saying the 23 car was basically, we've got to make this work, it's a zero pod Mercedes with a few Red Bull changes, and now are we saying for the 24 car, they've said, okay, we admit defeat, the whole car was a waste of time, now we're going to basically do a Red Bull, but we're going to put a few of our own tweaks on it. Is that where we're at? Um, yeah, I don't think anything you said there is wrong. I probably would put worded it slightly different, but yeah, you're absolutely right. They they kept the concept for 23, which they admit is a mistake. Um, and this year they've gone to, you know, the, a very similar cookie cutter approach to what everybody else is doing, as you say, with with their own tweaks. And other people are copying their tweaks. Red Bull have copied their their cooling uh, outlets. So um, yeah, I mean, I think. We've kind of reached a bit of a plateau in the current development of the cars. And I think the Red Bull is going to be the one that maybe breaks that mould and, and sets the path for people to follow over the rest of this year into next year. Just one other thing, Scarbs. You, you were talking about the compatibility of suspension against the floor and the movement of the dynamics. For the people out there that think it is inconceivable that Mercedes could have been so inept in that area up until now, how could that have happened? I mean, the, they were the world championship winning team for a number of years, incredibly powerful building blocks from which they could work. None of that is magic anyway. It's all to do with calculations and design, is it not? How could they have got it so wrong for two years? It's, I mean, it's one of those questions that's, you know, if I could answer it, I, I, I'd, I'd be working at Mercedes and making a, a fortune. But um, I think there's a number of factors there. First of all is in the 2022 regulation changes, obviously we went to ground effect, which kind of caught everyone out with the aero sensitivity issues with that car getting super close to the ground. And then also with the 2022 regulations, you had a real simplification of the inboard suspension components so things like the inerters the dampers and the springs and the hydraulic components which mercedes 
had um, through you know, previous engineers and then, then continued to develop, you know, really were the key, e key experts in that area. Losing that, ex you know, that, that ability to play with those functions left them uh, kind of a bit like what Williams did when you know Active was banned. Uh, suddenly you're left with, uh, you know, <laughs> we've lost our toys. How do we control this now? And I think it's taken them a while to understand and to get the two working together. And it, it, you know, it's just one of those jobs, particularly you know, in the, its restricted area. They've had to you know, completely reassess how they do work in the wind tunnel, particularly at super low ride heights. And that just, you know, everything takes so much longer now to, to work out. And they've just been caught out by the regulations as were so many other people. And I don't think that some of their aero concepts were necessarily helping them in that regard, certainly in that kind of that, this middle year of 2023, where they could have been making more progress, but they kind of initially stuck with the old concept uh, and eventually had to kind of admit defeat and have that mid-season update.